In a tropical forest in what's now Brazil, a greenish lizard perched high in the branches of a tree. It was pretty big, more than a meter long from its nose to the tip of its striped tail. Now, I know what you're thinking. You've seen me do this before. This is where I introduce you to some totally bizarre extinct animal, right? Well, I'm just full of surprises because this time, I'm just talking about an ordinary modern green iguana. Okay, but why? Because lizards belong to the most diverse group of terrestrial vertebrates on the planet, a group known as the squamates, which includes both lizards and snakes. There are nearly 11,000 species of squamates, more diverse than amphibians, mammals, even birds. And lizards, specifically, live everywhere but the coldest environments, and they range from tiny insect-eating geckos to giant Komodo dragons. So today, lizards are incredibly widespread and diverse. But it took them a long time to get to where they are now, because they used to face some pretty stiff competition from a group of lizard lookalikes. Basically, they were lizard imposters that went around filling a lot of niches that modern lizards occupy today, which just seems suspicious. To help knock out this competition, it took a lot of major changes, like the breakup of Pangaea, global changes in climate, and a mass extinction event, in order to set the stage for lizards to take over the world. The oldest fossil of a true lizard that we know of dates back to the mid-Triassic period, around 242 million years ago. And it took a while for us to figure out exactly what it was. It was discovered nearly 20 years ago in the northern Italian Alps, and was named Megachirella. But paleontologists weren't really sure if it was a lizard or not, and after it was described in 2002, it was just filed away in a museum collection. But recently, an ambitious grad student revisited the specimen and used CT scans to discover that it actually had the telltale features of a true lizard. For example, lizards have a single opening in the skull behind each eye, even though their ancestors started out with two. Plus, they have external ears and a movable bone in the upper jaw that allows for a wider gape. The skull of Megachirella had nearly all of these features. So, because of this fossil, we know that lizards were around during the Triassic, at least in some places, but it looks like they weren't really widespread. Instead, there were lots of things that looked like lizards, even though they weren't. These lizard lookalikes are known as Sphenodontians. Now, both lizards and Sphenodontians had emerged from a common reptile ancestor around 259 million years ago. And from the outside, Sphenodontians looked a lot like lizards. They had scales, round torsos, and long tails. They also shared some kind of lizardy adaptations, like skin that sheds, feet and ankles that are specialized for running over rough ground, and a hooked foot bone to help them climb. But on the inside, there were some important differences. Sphenodontians had two openings in the skull behind their eyes, no external ears, and a fixed jawbone. They also had two parallel rows of teeth fused to the upper jaw, so it's easy for researchers to tell if they weren't actually lizards, but a closely related group. Fossils of these lizard imposters have been found in lots of places like Europe, South Africa, Brazil, and the US, which tells us that they were already widespread during the Triassic period. And they had lots of different kinds of lifestyles too. In Germany, researchers found a sphenodontian with delicate jaws and teeth for eating prey like insects. And in Argentina, there was another that had wider teeth for grinding plants. Plus, it was one of the largest phenodontians ever known. But the shape of the world that these animals lived in was changing. Like, literally. During the Triassic period, the supercontinent of Pangaea was just beginning to drift apart into a northern and southern continent. The climate of Pangaea's interior had been hot and dry, and some sphenodontians apparently tolerated these conditions pretty well. But while they were diversifying and spreading all over the place by the late Triassic, the lizards were still there in the background, keeping a low profile. And by low, I mean almost invisible. After Megachirella, there's a gap of 75 million years in the fossil record. The next oldest lizard fossils date to 167 million years ago, in the Jurassic period, and they come from the British Isles. They include a variety of lizards, like members of the groups that today include skinks and maybe geckos. Other than those, there are just a handful of Jurassic fossils of lizards, from places like Morocco, Kyrgyzstan, Siberia, and the US. But around the same time, the Sphenodontians were just getting more diverse and widespread. More than 60 species lived during the Jurassic on four continents, with some, like Clevisaurus, spreading to the UK, Brazil, North America, Africa, and China. And these Jurassic lizard wannabes continue to act a lot like lizards do today. Some with sharp teeth for eating insects, some with wide teeth for grinding and shredding leaves, and even some living in marine environments as fish eaters. But things are about to change for both of these groups. It had been nearly 100 million years since that first lizard, Megachirella, originally showed up. But their evolutionary strategy of just sticking around was about to pay off during the Cretaceous period. 
One of the first groups of lizards to spread around the world had relatively short limbs and bony plates on their bodies. By the early Cretaceous, fossils of this group show up in Europe, Africa, Central and East Asia, and Brazil. Then, by the middle of the Cretaceous, there were hundreds of species that belonged to the modern families of lizards. Iguanas, geckos, skinks, baronids, and the helodermatids, or beaded lizards. Some specialized features had appeared too, like the adhesive toe pads of tree-climbing geckos. And the first of the teeoids, which includes whiptail lizards and tegus, showed up too. And during the late Cretaceous, between about 86 million and 66 million years ago, lizards really took off. The group known as the Iguanians, which includes iguanas, chameleons, and many others, spread around the world. And there was also an explosion in diversity of the mosasaurs. And yes, these marine reptiles were true lizards too. Isn't that weird? I was today years old when I learned that. Now, as the Cretaceous lizards caught their stride, the Sphenodontians, after dominating the planet for 100 million years, started to dwindle. As Pangaea continued to break apart, Sphenodontians became extinct in the Northern Hemisphere, and their southern range started to shrink. By the end of the Cretaceous, the only place where they really remained abundant was Patagonia. So paleontologists think that this means the lizards were gradually outcompeting the Sphenodontians, moving into their ecological niches. As lizards expanded in diversity and range, those same things contracted among the Sphenodontians. Okay, but why? Well, one possible explanation is that lizards were better suited to the changing climate. As the continents, formerly known as Pangaea, split apart, more land was exposed to more humid coastal conditions and inland seas, and the result was more wet habitats. Lizards seem to have adapted better to these new environments because the most abundant lizard fossils are from wetter places in the Northern Hemisphere. Eventually, those other lizard wannabes found themselves confined almost entirely to Patagonia, which is one of the drier refuges in the Southern continent. But the final, almost fatal blow for the Sphenodontians was the end Cretaceous mass extinction event about 66 million years ago. The one that wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs? Perhaps you've heard of it. Only one genus in South America is known to have made it through the extinction event, but it would ultimately end up becoming extinct. But we know that a few other groups must have held on too, somewhere, because Sphenodontians would show up again once more in New Zealand much later. Meanwhile, the vast majority of lizard families survived the end Cretaceous extinction, and we're still not sure why. But with the Sphenodontians almost totally gone, there was an explosion in lizard diversity, with the number of species increasing exponentially, a phenomenon that may be tied to different populations becoming isolated as the continents kept spreading apart. So during the Cretaceous period, lizards had looked pretty similar everywhere. But after that, they became more continent-specific, like the dozens of unique species that are only found in South America today. As for the Sphenodontians, well, only one species is still around, the Tuatara of New Zealand. Its ancestors, whoever they were, survived the end Cretaceous extinction, making it the lone survivor of that family of lizard-like non-lizards that originated more than a quarter of a billion years ago. So from their slow start in the Triassic to the start of their rise in the Cretaceous and their eventual explosion ever since, lizards have really played the long game. And while they're part of the most diverse and widespread group of reptiles on the planet today, it's worth pointing out that it took major global changes to make that happen. The time when the lizards took over the world reminds us that there's always another group waiting to step in when the conditions are just right. Now, before you go, you should check out an amazing new show called Overview on Terra. Hosted by my friend Johansson from It's Okay to Be Smart, Overview uses drone footage to tell mesmerizing stories about nature, engineering, and more from a 10,000 foot view. Like, literally. It's gorgeous, informative, and soothing stuff. Check out the link in our description and tell them Eon sent you. Okay, who's ready for some puns? Brace yourself, Blake. I want to thank this month's eontologists. <laughs> Sean Dennis, Jake Hart, Andy and Eric Higgins, John Davison Ng, and Patrick Seifert. Become an Eonite by supporting us at patreon.com slash eons. And remember, Eonites get perks, like submitting a joke for us to read. Like this one from Nora, you ready? Why was the sedimentary rock so cheap? Be <laughs> because it was on shale. Uh, where was I? Oh, I can't even. <laughs> and as always, thank you for joining me in the Constantine House of Studio. If you like what we do here, be sure to subscribe at youtube.com slash eons. Thank you.